Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash figure out your life with over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, and Kindle. Now let's get to the show. Welcome to Figure Out Your Life Podcast, the show where we try to find the answers to life's everyday questions. I am your host, Toya T, aka Toya T, PhD, aka Dr. T, aka your sister from another mister, aka uh, I'm your friend to the end, Heidi Ho. If you know that cultural reference, you get a bonus star. You can sit at my table. All right, let me stop being silly there. I I made a Chucky reference if you did not catch the drift. So anyway, hi guys, welcome back. It is a new week and I am back with a new episode for you guys. I know it seemed like we took a week off, but as you know, this month has been quite unexpected for me Uh, from the death of my grandmother to the emergency trip to Dominica for her funeral and then other stuff going on in my life plus trying like you know to put out quality podcast subject matter it has been stressful so I've just been taking my time but from now on we are going to stay consistent that's what we're going to do even though uh, next week your girl will be going to Thailand not on Monday so I'll get that out before then but I'll have to batch the next I think the next two episodes because I will be in Thailand you know living my life enjoying my little Black Friday sale my 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 early Christmas present to myself and hopefully a celebratory a trip either way I'm going to be enjoying it because Thailand has been on my bucket list my travel bucket list for a very long time uh, especially Phuket and I will be going to Phuket I'll be going to four different places in Thailand Bangkok uh, Chiang Mai Krabi Krabi and I, I need to look up all these pronunciations I've been like doing all this research and never looked up the pronunciations of these things so Bangkok Chiang Mai Krabi and Phuket which of course will all will include a trip to Kofifi Islands, you know, the most be- the beautiful islands that you see when everyone, someone puts up pictures of Thailand, that's usually where they're showing you, they're usually either showing you Krabi or, um, or Kofifi Islands, particularly James Bond Island, you know, where there was a James Bond movie filmed there, which I don't even know what James Bond movie it is. But if I told my dad, I should probably just ask my dad because he is like a James Bond historian. He loves James Bond and I'm, he can tell me, I'm sure. Uh, what that is. And I think since he doesn't listen to this, this podcast anyway, I think that's a good gift for him. I think I need to make sure that I go to James Bond Island and take a picture for him of of me, of course, and then frame it because why not? (laughs) But uh, that's where I'll be the next two weeks, but I'm determined to be consistent. I just am slowly getting back on a regular schedule, a somewhat regular schedule. So Anyway, um, let's go into what's going on in the world. I think I would be, um, it would be wrong for me not to mention, since I am recording this on Monday, to mention uh, the recent news about the death of uh, NBA legend Kobe Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna, um, Gianna Bryant, and the seven other people that were involved in the crash, which includes Uh, two other sets of parents. One sadly um, was a mother, father, and their daughter, and they left, um, they have two surviving kids. So could you imagine getting that phone call that your parents died, your sister died, and now you're an orphan? Gosh. Um, There was another set, uh, a mother and a daughter. There was, I think, a basketball coach on there, and then also the pilot. So um, prayers out to uh, their families and to their friends who are morning and for those who lost their lives like let's hope that they rest in peace and I pray I know this is kind of morbid but I pray that they didn't suffer that you know that they died immediately and there wasn't suffering that was like one of the things on my mind when you hear there's a helicopter crash you're like oh my gosh that is absolutely horrific and the different elements of it the fact that one if you are in a plane um, especially a small uh a uh, flying aircraft if you're a small aircraft like a helicopter which I've never been on a helicopter but 
you know, you can see the pilot, you can see the other people on there, you're all in close quarter, quarters. And so if they were having issues with the plane, with the helicopter, sorry, with the helicopter, they would know, they would be able to see the pilot in distress. And so, you know, you have that on top of the crash and then the fire. And so I hope that in their last moments, they were able to comfort each other, but then also that there wasn't extra suffering um, when, you know, at, at upon the crash. I hope they died on impact so that there wasn't extra suffering. That's it. So with that, I'm going to move on to today's topic, which you can see from the title that we will be talking about figuring out how to create the right mindset for your job search. Now, For many of you who have been listening, you know why this would be a topic that I find very interesting and why this is a topic that I would be researching to share with you guys. So, um, but for those who don't know who are new, I have been, um, I'm unemployed currently. I'm an unemployed educator slash college professor. Just all around, I'm I'm an educational professional who is currently between schools. Ooh, I like that. That's that's a that's a nice way of putting it. I'm an educational professional that is between schools, that is currently between schools, and looking for a new academic home. Oh, that sounds good. That sounds like something to put on a freaking cover letter. Yes. Look at all the stuff I've learned from my research and my practice. But anyway, I have been on the job market since 2014, 2015, pretty much when I um, completed my PhD program and was you know, looking for a full-time position because I was, while I was finishing off my PhD program, I started teaching at the institution that I, my former institution, and I was there for six years. And during that time, I was part-time pretty much the entire time except for one semester, which was very eye-opening for me because it showed me my value and what I could be making and what it's, how great it is to have benefits, to be teaching and have benefits. Like, teaching the same load and had benefits. And so I really been looking for a full-time position at the, at the, at my former academic institution and outside of it. And there were several times that I got pretty close to getting a full-time job um, among many other rejections, just straight out rejections. But I got really close. I called my five close calls where I made it to the final round. And, you know, there was, there was the meeting with every single person that you're supposed to meet with, (laughs) you know, you're meeting with like every person that you might work with. This is the, this is the administrative assistant. This is the Dean. This is the provost. This is one, a student that would be in the program. This is, you know, you're meeting all of these people and having all these interviews and everyone's talking you up and telling you how great you are. And then they give you the phone call or the email saying, well, unfortunately we decided to go with another candidate. Uh, and I've gotten enough of those that they had a significant impact on my mindset, particularly around jobs and my qualifications that I started getting to a point where I started to think like, maybe I will never get a job, which is not the right mindset to have. Like if you believe in what was it? The, um, the secret, uh, or the law of attractions, where if you put out something into the universe, you will attract it. If you're like, if you're saying that I am an amazing, you know, educational professional, I am great with students, I will get a job, I will be employed, I will, like, you will attract that if you continuously put that vibe out. Just like if you start thinking or start talking around your your your, your, <laughs> your phone or your computer and you say, like, I'm thinking about getting an iPhone 11. And the next thing you know, you go on Facebook and you see an ad that is for iPhone 11 you know, like, to, like, to, you know, for you to buy, it's the same thing. Like you're going to attract it. If you put it out there, you're going to attract it. Maybe not in the big brother way that I just mentioned with the ads, but like, it's the same thing. You're supposed to put it out there. And so I've been putting out there that I've been trying to put out there a new mindset that, you know, that says that I will be hired. I am worthy. I am amazing. What is for me is for me is going to come. I'm going to make this impact in the world that I know that I can make. And all I have to do is just be ready. And so that is what I have been doing since I have been unemployed or just in the midst of full-time job search mode, which I think that's a better way of saying than saying that I've been unemployed since last summer. Um, I have been fully focusing, not 100% all the time, but 
pretty much that time period was the time period of last fall, which is the first fall in like six years that I hadn't been teaching was about finding out who I was, who I am, what am I looking for? What I, what, what sets my soul on fire? What am I passionate about? What is my ideal job? Are there other uh, career avenues that I can, you know, um, that I can go down based off of my, my job, my, my, uh, my experience and my background. And so, you know, all of these things are very much important in the job search process. Cause it can take a long time. I told you I've been on the market since 2014 and that's a long time to be looking for something and getting, you know, rejected or getting close and not quite getting the job. So, um, I'm going to help. I know that some other people are having the same kind of experiences. I mean, we're in an economy where it is quite common for those with degrees and especially people of color with degrees are having a hard time finding full-time employment and particularly the type of employment that they are looking for. Like I've always said, like if I really wanted to work a job, I could move to Kansas and be teaching at university of Kansas or somewhere, but I don't want to live in Kansas. Like I don't know want. I don't even want to live in, you know, in, rural parts of Massachusetts where I wouldn't have to move, you know, out of state. Like I, I'm not interested. I know, you know, what kind of communities that I feel the most comfortable in. I know what kind of workspaces I'm most comfortable in. And, uh, this time, this time that I've taken to fully focus on my job search has pretty much shown me how important it is to stick to your guns. Like I know I, I didn't, you know, leave this, situation just to go into another shitty situation like that can't that can't make sense that can't be what um the whole point of this process is so I wanted to share with you guys a couple of ways to approach your job search and how to create a good or the right mindset uh to make your your job search process more successful and maybe even enjoyable like not a negative experience not a oh my gosh I have to go through this again. It takes so much time and energy, but seeing it as like a challenge, seeing it as, you know, this is an investment in my, in myself and being able to, you know, find the career that fits me the best that, you know, that make, that I'm very passionate about and, um, or that will lead me to the place that I want to be. So, um, it's all about just staying upbeat, conquering your fears, and then being able to face the job search head on when you're ready. So you don't get stuck in your mind. You don't get stuck, you know, um, you know, in this rut that you're able to just go out and find the job that's best for you. So here are some practical tips. I got five tips for you guys on how to create the right mindset for your job search. So number one is develop a growth mindset. Now you might've heard this word quite often. And if you're like me, and I'm just going to tell you, honestly, it was, I was probably like, um, it was probably a couple months ago that I found out what a growth mindset <laughs> means because I had seen it on quite a few applications, quite a few job, job calls. And I had to ask my mom like, okay, so you hire people. What is a growth mindset? Cause I have no idea. And she's like, you know, you're, you're, you're in a mindset that you're open to, you know, to feedback and change and, and developing yourself. And I was like, oh, okay. So I guess like who who would say that they didn't have a growth mindset? I'm not understanding how you don't have a growth mindset if you're applying for a job, but, um, I guess there is a difference because there is an opposite to growth mindset. And this is what I found. So growth mindset in itself came from Stanford professor, Carol Dweck's research on growth mindset. Uh, she shows that with growth mindset, you can train your mind to approach challenges with wonder, excitement, and resilience. So pretty much that you look at every single thing that you're approaching, you approach it with positivity, you approach it as, as an opportunity to grow, to learn, and to challenge yourself. On the opposite end, the fixed mindset carries the detrimental effect of making us react to challenges with fear or avoidance hence diminishing the potential to grow. So you can't grow because you think that you cannot change that. I, that saying that I am a a college professor, I have a PhD in sociology and that's what I am. Like I can't do anything else besides be a college professor because I went to school 
and got a PhD in sociology. That is a fixed mindset. That is saying that you can't do anything else and that you can't uh, stretch yourself or go in different directions. Oh, I can't, I don't need to practice for an interview because I've, 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 I've done interviews before and you know, I've gotten jobs. So who needs to practice? Who needs, who needs to change anything? And this is what they're talking about, about a fixed mindset that it, that you're just stuck in your ways and you're not open to change and growth. And for a growth mindset, you're open to it. You see it as a fun challenge, a happy challenge. You're excited about being able to, to learn something new and to grow. And for job seekers, I think this is very beneficial because every phase of today's job search process requires us to face rejection and a host of other challenges. Um, some of them are personal. Some of them are outside of ourselves. Um, but the growth mindset is almost required for getting the job, that you have to see yourself getting the job. You have to see yourself as being qualified for the job. You have to see yourself as being able to do the things that sh- that need to be done to get the job, to keep the job, to be promoted. Uh, for example, so here's something that I found within my research and they apply growth mindset to phases of like important processes or stages of the job search process. So for example, networking, the way that a growth mindset candidate Um, looks at networking is that they believe in their potential to be great networkers where fixed uh, mindset candidates focus on the possibility of rejection growth mindset candidates focus on the upside they see themselves as like this is an opportunity to grow and if um and i am definitely someone who can network well and if i make a mistake i can learn from it that's what they're looking at it and so here's what the research says about why this is important to have this kind of mindset towards networking, because networking that is very important. It it leads to 85% of the jobs that people get today are through networking. I can tell you the job that um, at my former institution, I actually got that through networking. I, I did. <laughs> I actually got the last three jobs <laughs> Through networking, the first one was through a friend. I said, "Hey, girl, um, is the is the the school that you're working at looking for, you know, adjunct lecturers or professors? Because I'm looking to teach, to get back into teaching." And this person, uh, this friend of mine, was like, "Yep, I'm actually leaving this position because I got a new job somewhere else, and they're actually looking for someone." This is the person, the name of the um, person that's hiring for the department tell her I sent you. I'll actually tell her that, you know, you're a friend of mine. And pretty much when I showed up to the interview, she was like, well, the job is yours. Like, all you have to do is like, give me the resume and stuff for HR. But like, if you want it, you can, you know, the job is yours. And I was like, wow. (laughs) And then the second job that I applied for, the same thing happened. They were like, oh, we spoke to, you know, the, the, the department chair, um, at the school that you also work at and they vouched for you. So you, if you want the job, you have it. And I was like, wow. And then the third job, (laughs) Um, was also the same thing. Like, oh yeah, that's my, you know, my friend is a good friend of yours. And she said that you're good people. So if you want this job, you got it. And I was like, wow. So three different things that I've gotten through networking. Uh, even, um, though, uh, the, even though there is, even though I mean, I'm like tripping over my words. It's funny because if you look at it, if you put, this information together with the fact that most people hate networking and even fewer people think that they're actually good at it. The result is that most job seekers resist or avoid the number one tactic that will help them accomplish their goal of getting a job. And so you have to find a way to have a growth mindset towards these different tactics or phases of the job search process. So for networking, here's a simple step that you can do. Uh, if you're, if you are trying to build it, start off slow, start off with asking people that, you know, ask them on Facebook, ask them through your, you know, text or call them on the phone and say, Hey guys, I did this actually. Hey everyone, I'm looking to, um, transition into this position or I'm looking for a new position that does this. So for example, I, when I first started, uh, thinking about different, uh, career paths, I, started thinking about, you know, academic advising and, you know, student support uh, work. And so I put out on my Facebook, like, hey, everyone, I'm looking to transition into an academic advisor job. If you know anything or have any tips for me, please, you know, reach out to me. I appreciate it. And I got quite a few people that reached out to me. 
and were trying like either told me about jobs were sending me jobs a lot of my friends were emailing me jobs even when they didn't fit <laughs> um, but I also was able to network with someone or connect to someone uh, through a mutual friend so someone who was my Facebook friend was like hey um, this person that is in the same fellowship program that we're in is uh, an academic advisor at you know this school and you should definitely talk to her here's her information tell her that I told you you know that I that that you that um tell her that I told you to talk to her and so what happened that came from that was that I ended up having an informational interview which until recently I didn't even know what that meant um and if you don't know what that means an informational interview is pretty much where you talk to somebody that is in the field that you want to enter or at the um at the the job at the that you want to work at the place that you want to work at so you contact them you introduce yourself tell them a bit about your background and you ask them questions about the position itself so if you for example for me asking like what is you know why are you where were you attracted to academic advising since you also started off as teaching like I did like how did you make that transition how um, how did that go what did you have to put on your resume did you have to take extra classes or do something to be able to get this position and what do you like about it? And, you know, this this was very helpful to me. And if you get if you get really lucky with the informational interview, you might actually get some insider information. So for the informational interview that I end up getting through this, you know, um, this contact <laughs> through this network uh, that I accessed, she actually offered to read my cover letter and made suggestions on what to add on it she actually edited it and like put in comments and said you know put this and say you focus on this put this because we're actually looking for people that um are you know interested in focusing on these issues and so she pretty much told me that and then she said you know also make sure to put in that you had an informational interview with me which is an act you know an extra step to show like how interested in the position uh, that I was and so if you're lucky you can get that but you can only get that if you open your mouth because you know as they say a uh, closed mouth doesn't get fit so if you're looking for a new job you're going to have to do some of the work and some of the easiest ways is to access your network in a way that is comfortable for you you don't have to go to uh, you know just a random networking event and just start cold talking um, to people that you don't know a group of people you can start off slow um, get the information of somebody else contact them meet them, meet them in person or or talk to them on the phone, whatever works best for you, get some information and then do it again with somebody else so that you are getting the most information that you can get. And there you go. You're networking. Just like how I said about the jobs that I got, the last three jobs, which I just only now realized that I got all three of those jobs <laughs> through networking. So um, what you really need to do is to focus your mental energies on these right things that will help you find you know, the, the opportunities that you're looking for growth mindset will help you do that. So that's something that you should, um, definitely look to de develop. And if you want more information, of course, about what growth mindset is, you know, what does it look like? How can you develop it? Um, there's of course information in the show notes where, um, you know, where I got some of this information. One of them is like actually really good because it talks about, you know, sex successful ways, um, to create a growth mindset and how it can help you get a job. So number two, recognize your value. <laughs> and this is what I'm talking about with the growth mindset th thing for me, like working, I'm still working on this growth mindset, still trying to keep myself like motivated, but I, I do know that I am hireable. I am someone who is highly qualified. I'm a great teacher. I'm an excellent teacher. I definitely have room to grow, but I know, I know what I'm good at and I'm good at teaching. Okay. I'm good at connecting with students. I find a way. <laughs> um, but this is what, this leads into number two. You need to recognize your value, recognize the value that you bring to the table because all of your experiences matter. Everything that you've done in your life that you experienced matters. It matters. And even if you think it doesn't fit, it can fit. Trust me, it fits. So for example, actually not for example. So let me get, let me talk more about this. So um, I actually got some information from another podcast. So this is from uh, Fatima, Dr. Fatima Williams 
podcast called Grad School. She just started it, so it's brand new. It's pretty much focused um, on PhDs that are looking for new career options, so looking for jobs outside of academia or those who are in grad school and are looking to keep their career options open or to figure out how best to um, get a a job after graduate school. So she had uh, one of her most recent episodes, which I'm very happy I listened to. Uh, she had an HR expert um, named Dorian uh, Dorian St. Fleur. Um, and she calls, she talks about recognizing your value, but she is a, she talks about it she calls it, um, she calls it finding your VIP. That's what, that's what, uh, Dorian calls it finding your VIP VIP standing for value impact and power. Now the value is about the contributions that you have brought to the table in the past. So she said, you know, including your volunteer work, your academic work, et cetera, whatever you've done in your life that you bring, you, you list, you get, you get that, you get a mental list, you write down or, you know, sit down and make a real list, like a, a written list of all of the things that you have done, all of the things that you have learned, all of the experiences that you have gathered. Um, And then you think about how have you contributed to the bottom line of wherever you used to work, of your former employer, your current employer, so that you can sell yourself. So you speak about yourself and your value as the backbone of your organization, since all support roles are important. I love that she said that. If you you are not, you know, the head boss, you're not the manager, director, CEO, whatever, that doesn't mean that you haven't been contributing to the growth of your organization that you worked for. Um, and that once you recognize that you're able to quantify what that looks like, I wish personally that I had spent more time trying to quantify things, but, um, you know, now I know now I will be paying more attention to it, but I found a way to, to quantify it as best as possible because I'll tell you in a second. So, um, once you realize the value that you have, then you link that to the impact. So then that's how you say, you know, these are all the things that I bring to the table and this is how it impacted the bottom line of my organization that I worked for, the business that I worked for, the institution that I worked for. And then from there, you communicate that information with power. I said, yes, yes. It's something, something great about hearing two black women professional black women, successful black women, um, giving out information to other like people of color, women of color, other black women like me, (laughs) uh, who are looking to, um, you know, looking for career options, looking to be successful uh, and find the job that fits well, um, for me. And then to hear, like, know your value, then talk about the impact of your value and then speak about it with power. That's why I said, like, you know, for me, I know that there are certain things that I do know about myself that I have, you know, had the time to sit down and think about things that people have told me. I know I'm a great educator. I know I'm a great teacher. And not just because my students told me, not just because of the, um, you know, of the grades that my students have, not because my students would go out and talk about things that they learned about in my class, not just because I have gotten uh, accommodations from the provost after a student talked about how great Uh, my class was and how great of a teacher I was and how impactful my teaching was. And not only because I got a freaking uh, university award, (laughs) you know, for, for, for my contributions to the university. I know this because I know it. (laughs) Okay. All those things, but I also know it. I know it. I know when I, when I show up in a classroom, when I meet with students, when I talk with students that I light up, I'm lighting up right now. I know, I know my passion you know, pushes through. I know that it comes across. It comes through my pores, even when I'm sick, even when I ain't got it, even when I'm just not in the mood. Okay. Even then I know about that about myself. And if you can speak about it with power and be confident in what you say, that, that puts you on a completely different level than other people. And so, um, you have to be able to recognize all of these things. So talking about quantifying things. So I, for example, uh, as I said, I haven't spent enough time quantifying things. I do know personally for the for my former institution that I had attracted my former department. I had attracted several students. I don't know how many, but I had not even several, many students to the department, many of them who were not sociology majors, who took my class and then became sociology majors, who told me that to my face and then also said that in front of the department chairs. 
Like, oh yeah, that's Professor T. Well, that's the reason that she's the reason that I became a sociology major or I became a sociology minor. I know I attracted students to the, the department. I just wish I had kept like actual track of the number so I can measure it, so I can quantify it. Because in this day and age, in this job market, apparently you have to be able to quantify everything. And so the only thing that I could qualify on my on my resume, my new resume that I have now, um, and on my cover letters is the number of students that I've taught. So being able to count up how many classes I've taught, pretty much estimate how many students that I've had contact with uh, is a quantifiable way for them to show my value, to show my impact, to say that I have been able to work with different students, uh, you know, a, a large number of students of diverse backgrounds. And, and that is very attractive to um, teaching positions and student student service or student centered um, positions that I'm looking for. So that's but that's but that's about knowing your value and recognizing your value. And I've gotten that again from taking the time to actually sit with myself and sit with others and listen to others and just kind of gather up and assess like what my value is, what what am, what am, what are my strengths, um, so that I can communicate that to new to potential employers. Um, if you don't know, so here's a, here's a suggestion. If you don't know, I know I have a couple of friends who want to start something new, but they don't know. They don't know where the next step is. They don't know what, what is it that they want to focus on? Where is the next path? Um, or if it's a side, a side, um, path or a side job, what is it? So here's a suggestion that I found brainstorm. So you brainstorm and apply, you brainstorm every single thing that comes to your mind, every single idea, every single project, every single kind of job, any, anything that just, just comes in your mind, you just write it down, write it down, just maybe take 10 minutes. If 10 minutes is too much, take five, because five is a good minute. Just, just don't even think about it, just don't even erase, just write, type, whatever. And then after that, if you brainstorm, apply that to identifying your talents and your possible future. So see if you see like common threads. What are some, what, what are the similar things that you keep coming up with and being able to use that as a way to pinpoint your future? Maybe you just go take those words and put it into a, into a job search engine and see what pops up. Um, another way of doing that is asking others what they see as your career strengths. You know how LinkedIn has that whole, like people recommend recommending you on ba- on certain skills. Um, it's the same thing. So you can ask people through LinkedIn. You can ask people on Facebook. Like I like to do that. My mama hates that I do. And she thinks I'm desperate when I ask people on Facebook who are my Facebook friends questions. Weird. But ask people, ask your neighbor, ask your, ask your former boss, ask your coworker, ask your uncle, ask your daddy, ask your mama, ask anybody, ask your kids. If you got them, what are your strengths? What are your career strengths? What are you good at? Um, you could also try rapid ideation, which is what I just said before, where you just come up with a bunch of ideas, write them down quickly, and then you um, kind of just pay attention to where it leads you. So those are the two things, so the brainstorming. So you either brainstorm through asking people what your strengths are and just writing everything down and then um, using that to identify your, your talents and possible features or you just used um, what I said before, rapid ideation, where you just write down everything that comes to your mind and then you um, then go through it and see what what you find. So, um, But the big thing about this is that you have to appreciate the, the big picture of everything. This will help you see how you might fit into various job types, including some unexpected ones. So for me, when I have been spending this time thinking about like, what are my skills? What, what, you know, what kind of, what is my background? What experiences do I have that can contribute to a new job, a new career path, a new future? And I started finding things like working for Facebook or Instagram as a user experience um, researcher. And I'm like, what is that? But when I looked, when I put all my skills on LinkedIn, I was finding these jobs that were saying like, you know, you're, you're pretty, you have quite a few of these, of these qualifications. And I'm like, wow, never even thought about that. And I found actually a couple people that had PhDs that were, went through grad school, got a PhD and actually started working like a social scientist working in in user experience. And I was like, wow, this is something that I never thought of, but I would have never thought of it if I didn't open up my options, if I didn't open up my mind to different possibilities. So um, this is the kind of things that you should do. Just kind of brainstorm about different things. I'm like, could I be a firefighter? I remember once when I was really upset with where I was at my job. I was like, can I be a campus police? 
because they they definitely getting paid and they definitely got benefits and they don't do anything but, but ride around in their cars, um, open up classrooms and not investigate hate crimes. <laughs> If you know where I worked, you know why that's funny, but not funny. But I even thought about that. And someone was like, oh, you got to go to the police academy. I was like, oh, I, ain't, I ain't doing that. <laughs> I was like, okay, strike that out. But I, I kept it open. Trust me. If if I could have easily become a campus police, like if I could have become Campo, I would have become Campo. Dr. T would have been Campo. I've been like, it, it's Officer Dr. T to you. Okay. Let, now give me that beer bottle. <laughs> um. So number three, put time, put the time and money into your search. Like be open to, to spending the time, the effort and the money. Um, what you need to think about and recognize is that the job search process requires some serious time commitment. There's no doubt that it's tough to do this while if you are working full time, um, which I found when I was working, even though it was like a part time I was considered a part-time worker. I was working full-time. I was not off the clock. <laughs> okay. These kids were constantly asking me questions. I was constantly grading. It's like, when do you have time to do things that I want to do? It's really, really hard to fit in job searches uh, during the school year for me. And I, and, and I actually ended up doing the most job searches like on school break. So spring break or, you know, like a random like federal holiday or summer breaks. That's when I really sent out stuff, but I really didn't have time. Now that I don't have um, and that I'm not working on between jobs, I've had a lot more time to spend on the job search process. So, um, but for, if you're working 40 hours a week or 40 plus a week, you, you're going to have to find a way to carve out 10 to 15 hours each week to invest in your future. Um, you're going to have to find it. You're going to have, or spend three days out of the seven days doing it. That's what unemployment um, suggests that you spend at least three, three days or three times. You've, you've done it three times out of the week uh, because that's what it is. It's an investment in yourself. Your first job search sets the stage or your first big job search sets the stage for your future decades of work experiences. So if you start off right, um, even if you're now mid career, or whatever, you can always restart and create these new, um, these new patterns, these new habits, uh, for your job search process. And, um, taking the time is one of them, making sure that you carve out time for it, just like you carve out time to watch TV or drink wine or go on a date with your significant other or watch Netflix and chill or anything, go to the gym. You, you, you need to find a time to carve, carve time out of your week, uh, for your job search, um, process for your job search. Uh, and when you make the time, you have to use it wisely. So just don't carve out the time and then, you know, do the same things over and over again that don't show you any results. You have to use your time wisely. Don't waste it. And there are some job search activities that have a very high payoff, uh, like networking, like I pointed out before. And there are others that you could simply be going through the motions without much to show for it in terms of real results. So like, you know, adding people on LinkedIn, um, just, you know, putting, searching for a job in a, a, a job search website or engine, like, yeah, you're doing it, but w- like, w- why are you doing it? Is it showing you any results? Uh, the important thing is that you need to recognize the difference between stuff that is worth your time, um, and stuff that is not worth your time, stuff that is, that is, that is, uh, quality time, quality job search time, quality job search activities. And so one high payoff job search activity, like I said, is networking or per, a person to person face networking, which is really good. Um, particularly, uh, from the research that I had done, they suggested that you find out who the recruiters and hiring managers are. And you can do that using LinkedIn. Um, that is, or you can use Google as a way to find it. You can also go to conferences cause that takes time and money to do that. Um, and also for like finding the recruiters and and hiring managers, like LinkedIn is a very good way to do that, but you have to like pay for like LinkedIn pro. And so again, that is also something that takes a little bit more money. I know I, I have LinkedIn pro now, so I can like pretty much access everything. I can talk to anybody. I can see who's looking at my, at my profile. And so, um, that's useful. They, they, they offer you like courses, as you can take, you know, through LinkedIn and everything, but that comes with like the pro, um, the pro membership. Uh, so you go to conferences, go to networking events. 
And when you go to these networking events and conferences, you have to show up and be personable. So you got to talk to people, talk to at least two people about your goals and your background. So be ready to do that. Be ready to put the time into doing that. And again, um, but first you need to spend time on developing a growth mindset where you completely have talked yourself up. You have completely seen yourself as someone who's open to growth, open to like, well, I, I don't have experience in that, but I definitely have experience in this and I'm willing to learn, um, on the job. Like, you know, just seeing yourself as being able to do anything that you want to do. And also, as I said, Number two, knowing your value, recognizing your value, knowing your VIP, coming, you know, coming strong with that VIP, being confident um, in your value and your impact and your power. Um, and so what else should you do? And you should do this also along with social media networking. So just because uh, person to person networking is cool, but doesn't mean that social media networking doesn't work too. Like I told you about how I was able to get in contact with um, someone for an informational interview that gave me a lot of great information that came through social media networking, but you can also join groups, um, on Facebook and LinkedIn, which again, since I have, <laughs> since I have been in between jobs, I have discovered LinkedIn groups and particularly Facebook groups. There's a lot of Facebook groups out there and not just like, you know, I like Pokemon, like Facebook groups. I mean, like groups that can really help you give you some insight. Like for me, for this podcast, I'm in um, women of color podcasters, which gives tons of great information about sponsors, about how to grow your network, how to get um, interview guests, how like a lot of great information, a lot of uh, good camaraderie support people, you know, doing reviews for reviews, listens for listens. Um, I'm also in the podcast moguls group, but that's a part of the course that I took. Again, putting my time and my money where my where my mouth is, like saying that I want to have a successful podcast and grow it includes actually putting the time and the work and the money in. And so um, social media networking is also very helpful, too, because they have groups. I know there I'm also in um, black on the job in the job market, which gives like job market um, job market suggestions. I'm in other like academic groups for, for women that will tell you about jobs, you know, new job searches. Um, they'll also like give advice if you have a question about something. And so social media groups are also very helpful for that too. Um, as long as you use them appropriately, you go out there, you put out what you're looking for, you put out your background, you ask a question like, and you will find it. Um, and you might also find a connection to somebody. So, also, submitting applications uh, online for jobs you fit perfectly is also time well spent. So instead of, like I said, just going into the random job search websites and just applying to everything that you see, like, okay, you said teaching. Okay, that's the teaching. I'm just going to apply to everything that says teaching. Instead of doing that, actually spending the time to know what you're looking for and to apply for the jobs that fit perfectly. So if you're looking to, like for me, I'm open to, moving and so I have my job search um I have it I have that as a filter like I'm open to moving but I'm open to moving only to particular places because I realize after spending the last couple years um in last like going on nine years in Massachusetts my home to my home state that um there's a lot of things that I've gotten used to that are very liberal here that are not so liberal in other places and I don't want to live in any of these states that have like these draconian laws that they're trying, that they still have or trying to pass. I'm not trying to be somewhere where they're trying to take away abortion rights. I'm sorry. No, because if you take that away, you're going to take away something else. You're going to be trying to take away free birth control. And then you go there and then all of a sudden we're in freaking, we're in the, um, the handmaid's tale. And I ain't looking to be in a handmaid's tale. So I know there's certain states that are livable for me. So like I have like, you know, parts of New England. I know I don't want to live in Maine. It's not happening. It's beautiful during the summer, but I ain't living there. Okay. I like having, I like being able to see some brown, brown folks. There ain't too many of them up there in Maine. Um, and in Vermont, cut that out. Not happening. Parts of New Hampshire, only if it's close to Massachusetts, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, New York, cause I've lived there before, but only New York city, upstate New York. I've looked at stuff like things open at, at Cornell, and Syracuse, and I'm like, mm, there's a reason why I didn't go to college in upstate New York, because I didn't want to. Didn't want to. So why would I want to get a job there and live there? No. 
Um, I had Georgia for a bit because I lived in Atlanta, but I also know Georgia is one of those places that was trying to pass like, you know, the freaking anti-abortion laws. And I was like, eh. and then you also got anti-immigrant stuff in there. I was like, eh. I mean, pretty much if you step foot out of Atlanta, you're in the South, like the real, like, like South, like Confederate flag South. And I'm not interested in that. And so I know I can't do that Midwest. I know I can do the weather, but I know there's certain things that um, in the Midwest, like it'd have to be Chicago because Cleveland apparently is very backwards. And also from the research that I've done about livability for black women, Cleveland is at the bottom of places that are best for black women to live. And I like to live. So this is how I've put this together. But that took time to research this stuff, to combine it to compile it, not combine it, compile it, and then come up with something. Also, I would live in California because I've lived there before and it's pretty liberal. It's, it's huge, but pretty liberal. And I was, I was like in my best shape health-wise when I lived in California. I mean, I was snatched, okay? So that is a benefit except for the fact that I was three, three hours behind my entire family and friends and it took forever for me to be able to go anywhere and seeing that my parents are getting older, I would like to be somewhat closer to them. Um, that wouldn't take me like a six hour flight to get to them. Just saying. A six hour flight that doesn't include having to go through LAX, which is like the worst airport in the country, I swear. Anyway, so you gotta put the time and energy in. You gotta know what you want. You gotta know the filters. Are you open to moving? Where do you wanna live? What kind of jobs are you looking for? And be able to scan, scan through it. Not just looking at the qualifications and saying, well, I don't have that, I have this. Not just that. You got to look at the whole thing. You got to look at like the mission statements. You might want to do some um, some some internet stalking, like I like to do, or AK or also known as AKA also known as um, market research, labor market research, where you look and find out about people who work at the places that you want to work at, and you see where else they worked, how long they have worked in this certain place, are they moving to different locations? different positions in the company in a short period of time that might be like you know something that you might want to look out for so if you're going to do that search you might see a job that you want to work at so say for example you want to work at Cornell and you see Cornell has all these um, job openings and you just put Cornell in LinkedIn and they'll show you every single person that has Cornell as their current employer or their former employer and then you can look at the information if you got LinkedIn Pro you can look at all the information so I'm just going to point that out to you so you got to put the work in. It's not just about submitting everything. You got to take the time and think about what am I going to do? What do I want to do and apply to the things that fit best so you're not wasting your time because that takes a lot of time too. Trust me. Uh, once I had gotten all my stuff together, which I will talk about in the money part of it, like putting your money where your mouth is and, and putting the money and the effort in, like I was applying to things like back to back to back to back. And these were all the things that fit um, because I had taken the time to uh, c collect, to I took the time to create the job materials that I needed and also to create the right mindset and to also figure out what I want. So uh, here are some things that you can also do with money. So if you don't have the time you and you have the money, so you're working 40 hours plus a week, but you ain't got the time to carve out 10 to 15 hours a week to be soul searching and doing labor market research, uh, you can cut some of that in half by um, spending the money to find a way to get it done quicker. So you can, one, get a career coach, pay for a career coach. So the two people I talked about on the get the grad schooled um, podcast, um, both have like career coaching, particularly Dr. Fatima Williams is a career coach. And you can pay for her services and she can help you identify, you know, whatever career uh, path that you want to go down and how to go about um, getting a job in that in that path. Uh, I thought about hiring her, but I was like, I'm a, I don't know if I'm there yet because it cost money. And I didn't know if I had um, if I wanted to spend that yet. You can also pay for a resume writing service, which is what I did. I spent the first few months, so September, October, November, just obsessing over my resume and my cover letter and just picking over it and like changing it. I had like 15 different templates, new templates, modern templates, old templates. Like if you look on my computer and my documents, you would probably find, you would find 15 different resumes, Latoya resume, Latoya Tavernier resume, new resume, new job resume, um, full resume. <laughs> <laughs> modified resume like all these resumes and I wasn't I wasn't getting anywhere with it because I was so stressed out about my resume and thinking that you know it just wasn't 
go- it just wasn't the way that I wanted it to look. It didn't really put across like all of my great qualifications and my background and my passion for working with students um, because I felt like all my stuff was the same and I was trying to kind of branch out and be attractive to different to different career fields. And so I just bit the bullet and bought and paid for a resume service. I paid for top resume. I'll put the, sh- the information in the show notes. I, s- I found out about it through higher ed jobs. So, you know, what's within the, you know, within a, a trusted job search um, website uh, within my field. And they had like, you know, oh, do you want to top, you know, do you want a, a professional resume writer? And I was like, you know what, let me do it. I talked to my mom about it. She's like, you know, if it, the best thing to do is if you can't get it done and you can get someone to do it for you, pay for it. If you have the money, pay for it. And I was like, you know what? I do. Like if, if you're talking about making a investment in myself, definitely need to make that investment. So I think, I think it was about like $200. Don't, I think it's about 199, maybe 299, but it's not more than $300 what I paid for. And what comes with the service, what I liked about it is that you get a personal resume writer who will work with you to revise your 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 resume. I also bought the the package that include the cover letter, which um is very different if you're coming from like academic cover letters to like non-academic cover letters, so I needed help with that because everything that I have, my CV and my cover letter was very much focused towards academic jobs and I was like, okay, I need something that's going to and I mean like tenure track or postdoc jobs. Like I needed something that could translate to other positions um, that didn't have like all this information on it. Because if you know a CV, a CV, especially when you're an academic, is like it, the longer it is, the better. Because then it shows like everything that you've done. But for resumes, they don't want to see all that. They want to see like they want you to get to the point. And the same thing with the cover letter for academics. Cover letters are like super long. They're like a page and a half, maybe two pages. And you're you're talking about everything that's already on your resume, not on your not already on your CV, not on your CV. You're saying a lot of stuff. Um, and for non-academic job searches, they don't want all of that information. They want to ask you that when they when they if they call you for an interview, they don't want to have to read all these words. And so it worked well because they uh, give you two full revisions. So I sent in I I had to to go through a a whole survey on what I'm looking for, why I'm using this resume service, like, you know, the types of jobs that I'm looking to apply to. And then I had to give them copies of of my resume and my and a cover letter, like a sample cover letter. And. Um, the person worked on it. He worked on it, uh, for a couple days, like I think less than maybe like three or four days. Cause they, they give you like a, like a short turnaround. I think you have supposed to, you're supposed to get everything done. I think within two weeks, um, just so that they can keep track of like their guarantee. Cause they guarantee the one that I paid for that you will get a, a call for an interview within six weeks of, of, you know, getting the professionally done resume and cover letter and sending it out. Um, and so, uh, the first swipe he did it, uh, there's a couple things that I, you know, I wanted to change and he actually put out things that I can change myself. Um, but the first one I was like, okay, I, I want you to focus on this. I don't know how best to talk about this experience that I've had, but I want to put that on there. And he worked with me until it, it got right. And then when we were done, um, I just tweaked a couple of things that I felt like still, but something I could do myself. And that was like, I did that, um, for black Friday. So I got it right after Thanksgiving. Um, I got my full on resume, full new resume and cover letter by mid December after Christmas, as soon as after Christmas hit, because I was like putting things before Christmas is not going to get anywhere because all, all places are just getting ready for Christmas. (laughs) And so I sent out everything after Christmas, like that between space between like Christmas and new year's. And then after new year's, I was like, boom, 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 boom. Uh, and sent out resumes, like tons of resumes, just like it took me like no time to send out these resumes to these jobs that I had already identified as jobs I wanted to work at, went through really quickly. And I will tell you right now that I did get a call back for a call for an interview with this new resume and and cover letter. So I, I can't go back to top resume and ask them for my money back because they had a money back guarantee, a six week guarantee that you get an interview and they got me an interview. And so uh, I'm telling you, put the money 
And if you got the money and you don't have the time or you have spent the time and it's just frustrating you and it's causing all the anxiety like it was for me, like staring at a line on your resume for the entire day and only changing one word and then changing it back, go ahead and pay for it. Uh, You might also want to look into paying for uh, like a skills class or professional development course, you know, something that if you don't know how to. Um, use Microsoft Office that you can take something to help you with that. If you want to learn how to code, you can take a class on that. If you want to, you know, anything, anything that that is required of you um, for the job that you're looking for, like go ahead and pay for that. Go to conferences. Conferences cost money. Um, Pick the conferences that definitely will put you in the rooms with the people that can get you to where you want to go. Um, So if it's within your field, like professional conferences, just make the, like pay, if you can't afford all of them, cause they're usually like really high. Like I went to the African American women in higher education conference in, um, that was in Boston, uh, in October and I had to pay for a membership and pay for the, the conference fees to go to it. It costs like, it definitely was like over a hundred something dollars, but it was worth it. Cause I got to meet a lot of people, a lot of black women within the field, within African, within higher education that, you know, hiring managers, um, deans, um, other like, you know, um, people who are looking for jobs. So I really got a, lo- a lot of good connections and information that I am still sitting on and still using. Um, and if I, if I need to access, um, I can still access. Uh, and also join professional organizations like that also costs money. But if you're trying to get into a certain field, national organizations for like, you know, professional organizers or the National Association for Academic Advisors or the National Association for Engineers or whatever, go ahead and join that because they also have lots of good options for you. But you have to spend the money to be able to access them. So put your money, put your money there, put your money wisely into something that can benefit you. Okay, two more. So number four, right? This is quick. So number four, manage your fear. We talked about fear before. We talked about my fear of failure and how to deal with fear of failure and actually get things done that you want to get done. Um, Fear can manifest itself before you've even landed a job, uh, especially during the especially during the interview process. Like it can lead to you having like a shaky interview performance. Like I know for me, like I... I know that I'm qualified for something. So I had two interviews this past month, one video, one in person. um, And both of them, I prepared for them, but I still was like super nervous, (laughs) like still super nervous. The in-person one, they were like, are you okay? Are you doing good? I was like, yeah, I'm just like, I had to be honest because they kept asking me like, you know, be honest. I was like, I am stressed. Like I am already critiquing myself. I'm already like going over like what answers I did, like a word I said wrong. Like I'm my worst critic and I'm just trying to process everything and still be prepared for the rest of the interviews. Um, I said this to the recruiter, not like, not, um, you know, people while I was talking to them, like during the interview, but you need to learn how to manage it because it could lead to a poor interview performance. Uh, So what you need to end up doing is do some self-analysis about the issues that you're most concerned about. Write down your fears and take a good hard look at them. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of people thinking that you're not qualified? Are you afraid of, you know, falling on your face? Are you afraid of, because that's a lot of things I think about too. That's why you have to think about your whole, when you prep for an interview, you got to think about everything. I was thinking about like, Okay, like, um, how easy will it be for me to be able to use the bathroom in this outfit? Um, I don't want to wear heels or wear flats because I don't want the potential of my feet hurting or tripping on something because I have heels on. You know, I want to wear this color because I know it looks well on my skin and um, it also makes me feel good about myself. So it it will help me with my confidence, like all these things that you don't want to be thinking. I did my nails because I knew that when my nails aren't done, I pay a lot of attention to my nails and that could be distracting to me during the interview. Like all these things are fears. Like I'm afraid of this. So you can, you have to sit down and kind of think about what these issues are and then address them. I know, um, I, for me, like it was just getting through the nerves and I spent the entire like commute to my interview, just like listening to uh, podcasts that were about interviews and how, how to slay interviews. Uh, I actually used, um, you know, when they ask you, like when you're in the final parts of your interview and they're like, is there any questions that you have for us? I actually got that from 
a question I used, I actually got from the podcast I was listening to on the way there. I actually listened to the podcast and just particularly that part about good questions to ask at the end. I listened to it several times so I could have the questions like in my brain, like just ready in burned in my brain. So I'd be ready uh, to ask the question. And so when they did ask that question, I was ready. I was like, oh yeah. So, you know, blah, 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 blah. And they were like, oh, so you, you, you serious. And I was like, yep. <laughs> So just you just kind of have to think about like because I knew that was something that I was afraid that I might flub. So I prepared for it. But you have to think about the things that that scare you to be able to overcome them. Uh, Talk to people who have some have made similar changes uh, to what you're considering. So if like I said, like I wanted to to transition into academic advising. So I spoke to people who are academic advisors Um, also about like being unemployed for a, for a significant amount of time. I talked to other people who are also unemployed or looking for career changes just to help me feel like I wasn't crazy because, uh, you know, um, if you can't tell I'm really close to my parents, but for both of them, they pretty much worked the same job for 20 something years. Like my dad worked one, like, you know, worked at one particular job and retired from it. And he worked there for like 25 years. And, um, my mother has been at her job for like over 30 something years. Like, much older than my brother <laughs> and you know it's that's not what it is right now like I was telling her like you the it's she just could they just could not understand that I wanted to um that I was going to take time in between my jobs <laughs> like my old job and finding a new job to actually like figure out the process and spend time developing myself and being prepared for the job um the job market and um that is because like they come from a different generation of like people back then were getting jobs, getting stable jobs with pensions and retirement and all kinds of things. And they just stick with it until they, you know, reach retirement age and they retire. Uh, in my generation, it's like if, if the energy is off, if it's toxic, if it's this, if it's that, I mean, some places aren't even giving us job security. A lot of the jobs of yesteryear are now going away that were good paying jobs. Um, and so like even within academia, like we're slowly getting replaced by online courses because it's much cheaper for universities to teach via online, teach an online course, get one person to teach a whole bunch of people who don't have to show up and use up the lights and the electricity and all this other stuff that they have to pay for. Um, and it it is something that's way more cost effective than having a professor that has to show up and people in a room. And then you have to like have an office for them and pay like all the stuff they did. It's just much cheaper. And so some of these departments are already like slowly disappearing and some of them more quickly uh, because of a lack of enrollment or a lack of need for, for in-person teaching. And so, um, you really have to just be able to talk to other people that understand the process, talk to other people that are thinking about making career changes. It's been very interesting during these last couple of months talking to other people who are like, yeah, I also am looking for a new job. I'm also trying to transition out of teaching at a university. I'm also trying to find a new career path. I'm also trying to step back and do blah, 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 blah. So it's been really good to kind of connect with people. And this podcast has been one of those ways that people I've talked about it, my struggles and my triumphs and all this, all this whole up and down process of, um, you know, trying to better myself, trying to find myself, trying to find my new path and having people reach out to me via, you know, DM in person, email and saying like, you know, I feel you, I'm in the same position, you got this, or here's some things that helped me that has been really helpful. Um, another thing you need to do while managing your fear is accept uncertainty. Know that there are aspects of life and career that you cannot control. Okay. And nothing about your new job can change that. So just getting, just because you went from an old job to a new job doesn't mean that you're going to be able to control more things. Uh, for example, no matter the environment, you're still be in control of the effort you put into your job. And so even if it's toxic, like I said, for my other job, when it was getting, when it was getting bad and I just could, I just didn't want to be there anymore. One thing that worked for me is the teaching and being able to be in the classroom. I said, kids, no matter what, how I feel outside of this, about how the school is being run, about new policies and things happening on campus that, you know, shouldn't be happening right here. I will never waver from this. I am, I am here for you. I am, it is not, you are never the problem. I love teaching. I love being here. And, you know, being here teaching you, not necessarily the space, but I love teaching you. And so um, 
that is something I can control. I can control how much effort you can control how much effort you put into your job, but you may not be able to control the environment. And so if you stay in control of what you can, the fear can go away because you know that you know about the things that you can control. Another thing, embrace rejections. Like I said, I got so many rejections. I got five, I got all the way to the end and got rejected five different times. When I like when people in like at even when I was an internal hire, external hire, people, you know, being really nice to you. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. And then rejection. And so uh, you have to embrace rejection. Successful people are often rejected. They're not, it, there's a, some kind of idea that people who are successful never received, never experienced rejection. They have. The only way you can be successful is if you are rejected, if you put yourself out there to be rejected. And if you want more tips on how to deal with that or fear of failure or whatever, definitely check out my podcast, the, one of the po- podcast episodes about um, fear of failure and how to deal with a fear of failure, because it definitely is something that it, it's, it, everyone experiences it and you just have to know how to deal with it, how to, how to move through it and move forward. And number five, um, on this is accept the process and do the groundwork, do the work when you do it once. And this is what I got from the podcast grad school and particularly from, uh, Dorian St. Fleur. She said this, so invest the time to really, to like when you, she said, when you do it once, you don't have to, to spend a lot of time starting from scratch. Like, so if you're going to look for a new job, you're in a job, but if you did the work beforehand, if, you know, then you won't have to spend all this time doing the research, doing all of this work because you would have already done it. You just pick up where you left off. And so you have to invest the time to really get it right, get clear and understand your value and build on that as you progress in your career. I said, yes, sister, I had to write it down and tell it to you guys. Um, and you can go listen to it for yourself. I'll put again, the information for that podcast in the show notes. Um, she, you know, she was saying that it may take three weeks or six to seven months to get ready to do the groundwork when you're doing the groundwork. But once you get it done, once you get it done, it cuts out all that extra work and time. You can just pick up, you know, where to, where you left off and you just, you just go, you hit the ground running. And so you got to accept the process, accept that it's going to take time. And then you got to do the work. And then after that, apply, apply and be confident, know your value, know your impact and speak about it with confidence and power. And with that, I am done with this section, guys. Okay, time for the last section. This is figure this out. And this is going to be real quick. And it's connected to the Kobe Bryant, the the news about Kobe Bryant's death. Um, And so figure this out for me, guys. When is it appropriate to talk about someone's misdeeds and bad deeds or whatever after they've died tragically? Now, I only want to know this because I have seen at least two different people who said, is it too soon to talk about, you know, Kobe Bryant's sexual assault um, survivors? And I'm like, are you fucking serious? I mean, sorry, that's that's the only word I can, like, are you serious? I get it. There are people that I don't like, 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 like 45. Or as Forrest Rock says, um, you're a stupid ass president. <laughs> Y'all stupid ass person. She calls him Wysap. So Mr. 45, I don't care for him. I think he's an evil man. I think he is the scum of the earth. I think he is a waste of space. But if he dropped dead like tomorrow in the same manner that Kobe Bryant did, so in a tragic manner, he died from a fiery um, helicopter crash with one of his kids. I don't think I'm going to go out and be like publicly saying, oh, dang dong, you know, he's dead. Like, you know, I feel, you know, like, you know, I know his, his, the survivors of his sexual assaults um, or alleged sexual assaults. Let me put that out there so I don't get sued, um, are vindicated, vindic- vindicated, and they must feel, you know, how, how do the survivors feel about their, about their, um, about the perpetrator of their sexual assault, you know, dying and people praising this person. Like I wasn't, I would not do that. Now, would I do that in the privacy of my own home and maybe in the privacy of my own head? Yes. But I wouldn't put it out there for the world to see one, because you know how easily people be getting canceled now, (laughs) canceled and fired. So celebrities get canceled, regular people get fired. And, um, Somebody might take offense to that and not saying that you can't say things that, 
you know, about sexual assault. And especially like, there's no way that if, if someone has been accused of sexual assault, that we should be protecting them, no matter how famous they are or how much good they've done in their lives. But in the same news story, like within, within 24 hours, before he's even been buried, before the bodies were even identified, okay, before the, before we even knew how many people were in the helicopter, because at first they were saying five people, and then they finally said it was seven other people um, outside of Kobe and his daughter. Before, the, before his wife has been able to even collect the bodies or identify the bodies, why are you talking about this? Why are you talking about, like, sexual assault allegations that, one, we all know what the Kobe Bryant uh, case that happened a while back. I mean, some of the people, I mean, some of the, some of, some of my students, I definitely know weren't, <laughs> weren't born at that time. I don't even know if my brother was born at that time. No, he was, he was born in 93. Um, but I don't think he would even remember it cause he was a child. Okay. I remember it. Okay. We all remember that story. Um, and I haven't heard anything else since then. I have been keeping up with it. Uh, not because I don't care about sexual assault or anything, but like, I just haven't been paying attention to it. I'm not, I wasn't some huge Kobe fan. I wasn't a Lakers fan. I mean, I'm from Boston. I'm a Celtics fan by default. Um, but in regardless of that, I'm not really a big sports fan and it hasn't been like big public news. Yes. I know that there definitely has been, um, at least one allegation. I didn't know about many others, but I wasn't going to pull, pull that information up and start talking about it and start saying, is it too soon to talk about this? And then when you get backlash, people talking about, well, I guess I've learned that you can't talk about, you know, um, a, a, um, you can't talk about someone who's a perpetrator of sexual assaults. Um, you, um, you know, their misdeeds, I guess you have to be, you have to be respectful. And I'm like, why am I just being respectful about human life? Like when have we lost that? that that connect and I'm talking about people who have degrees okay people who have degrees or and sense degrees and sense degrees and or sense and I'm starting to think neither because I get it I get it but if you are personally connected to it why are we talking about it like why are we talking about it like do you know one of the assault victims personally is this your mama your friend your sister um is this someone you know personally then I'm like okay but even then I don't think I would open up my mouth to say anything until after he was buried. I mean, not just respect, not to say that you have to respect someone who um, may have assaulted you. I'm saying just in general, just out of like, you know, this person has family and friends that are mourning them. You know that this death was, tra- was a tragic death. It was a tragic accident. Um, and you know, it wasn't just him. It was also his daughter too. So like adding that extra element And this person had, like, again, again, let me know if that, if that makes sense to you. Is is it okay for us to just start talking about misdeeds or is it still rude and like untactful? Is that a name? Is that a word? Untactful? Is that lacking tact? Is it, is it um, just against like, like poor manners? Is it? just plain stupid to start talking about allegations after like within a 24 within less than 24 hours of this person dying. Just let me know. Let me know because I don't get it. I don't get it. I'm not saying that Kobe was a saint. I'm not saying anybody is a saint. I'm not saying that if, you know, Bill Cosby was in the same situation or R Kelly, I can't tell you if our, if R Kelly died in a tragic accident with one of his kids or just died in a tragic accident period with other people around that I would turn around my mouth and say, well, you know, his, his survivors must feel, you know, the survivors of his sexual assaults must feel very good about themselves. Or, I, or they must feel some relief that he's no longer in the world. Like what, what, Again, this is stuff that you keep in the privacy of your house and, or maybe the privacy of your head. You don't put it on social media. And that's why I saw it on Facebook and Twitter. And I was like, okay, I'm not engaging in that because one, I, I don't have a dog in this fight. Again, I'm not invested in this. I'm not affected by this personally. Um, but I do understand that there is a time and place for everything. And definitely, I think, I would hope that the time to talk about the misdeeds of someone who has passed on is not within 24 hours of their death. That's all. So 
That's all I got to say. But you let me know when it's the appropriate time. Is it, is it, is it, you know, any time that you want to, is it like at the moment of their death? Um, or do you have to wait until after they're buried? Do you wait a year or do you just not say nothing at all and keep it to yourself? Or what, what is the protocol? Let me know. And with that, I'm done with this episode. It turned out to be longer than I expected, but I think full of great information. Trust me, I re-recorded several of these sections more than once because I was trying to be as succinct as possible and be as relevant as possible because I do take in feedback. So and the feedback I received was from my mother, who I'm hoping, again, if I say her name enough times, she will not appear on my listeners list. <laughs> I know I'm going to get... Ooh, she gonna she gonna get on me for this one. I know it, I know it. But anyway, thanks guys for listening. Um, again, if you really enjoy the show, if you are feeling it, please go ahead and show me some love in the reviews. If you are listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please leave me a review there. Rate and review the podcast so that I can be found by more people. If you listen to me on any other platform, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you go, Google Podcasts. Wherever you're listening to me, give me a review if you have not done so. Also, if you have done it, um, or even if you have not, um, please share with other people. Share this with people that you think will find this helpful. Share this with any person that you think will enjoy the content and the sound of uh, the content of this podcast and the sound of my voice. Um, just to help me grow, like uh, it's it's. I, I promise you, this year we're gonna have some great topics discussed. We're gonna have some great content. We're gonna have a great time. We're gonna get to know each other, and I hope to get to know each other, to get to know each other even more. Uh, if you join the figure at figure it out Friday newsletter which you can find information in the show notes. If you just want to go straight to there yourself, you can go to figureoutyourlifeblog.com slash newsletter, and then you can sign up and you can get all the updates about the about me, about the podcast, and about other things that I have found in life, other gems that I'm going to share. And I promise you there'll be one coming out this week because, uh, again, I told you I'm going to be back on a schedule. I'm, uh, things are starting to straighten out. Um, and, uh, I really want to be consistent so that we can continue to grow. You can count on me and we can just, you know, um, figure out life together. So with that, I hope you guys have a blessed morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time you're listening to this, wherever you are, I just want you guys to be safe. Okay. Be safe. And I want you to, to live your life, figure out your life and live it. And I will talk to you guys next week. All right, guys. Bye.